like we are almost in full participation. So I will go ahead and ask uh, Mr. Sean Yi, if you don't mind, please uh, keeping an eye on the waiting room as we have uh, City College uh, community members and uh, participants join us. Uh, but we will go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, City College, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope your spring semester is off to a great start. Uh, we do have about an hour allocated this afternoon, so we will jump right into it. Uh, just a couple of items of housekeeping um, and reminders is that we are uh, recording this session uh, so we can uh, place it on our uh, website so it can be viewed at a later date. Uh, in the middle of a semester on a Thursday afternoon, I know we have faculty and staff working with students, so we want to make sure uh, the option to view it at a later date is uh, there for them. <clears throat> Additionally, as you may be able to see, the chat function uh, is up and running. Uh, we are going to uh, monitor the chat and save the chat uh, and review it later. So I just wanted to, to share that with the group before we get started. <clears throat> All right, and it looks like we've got 223 participants. That is uh, excellent. And we will go ahead and pull up our first uh, item. So if I may uh, share the screen, uh, we will take a brief look at uh, what's on the agenda today? So we are going to uh, share some preliminary 22-23 uh, budget information and look at a uh, few years uh, after uh, the next fiscal year in regards to a projection or financial projections. Uh, we're going to discuss the March 15th process and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So we have about an hour allocated. Uh, we'd like to spend the first 30 minutes or so uh, sharing information and then hopefully the second 30 minutes uh, engaging in campus dialogue and trying to respond to your questions uh, as best as possible. Uh, this is the beginning of what will be a lengthy process uh, throughout the remainder of the spring semester. Uh, so just real quickly, uh, the next steps is to engage stakeholders in more detail uh, in some of our governance groups. So the PGC, the Budget Committee, our Academic and Classified Senates, as well as other stakeholder groups uh, who may want to uh, engage in these conversations. <clears throat> Real quickly, I do wanna just make a mention that I know not all of our governance groups or all of our committees are listed. If there are uh, opportunities uh, to do a budget discussion at your committee or at your governance group, uh, please send me an email. We'll get it on the calendar. Um, I want to make sure that uh, I provide as much information as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we'll follow up with more campus forms on Friday, uh, April 8th, tentative dates, and Friday, May 20th, both at noon. But we'll have more information out here uh, in the near future. So now I'm going to uh, take off the... Stop share and then we will get our uh, projections up to look at them together. <coughs> All right. I appreciate a couple moments as I fumble through the Zoom screens. All right, I hope everybody can see uh, this document in looking at uh, waving hands and it looks like everybody can see it. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, what we have here is a five year uh, financial forecast. Uh, and starting to the far left, we have uh, the actual years starting in 2019 20, and then color coordinated throughout the remainder of the spreadsheet as we move right. Uh, we start looking into uh, current year and into the future years. And we'll drop this document uh, in the chat function. I should probably do that now so everybody has a chance to uh, look at it on their own device so you can enlarge it if needed. So there is a uh, file that was just dropped into the chat. So please open that up on your own device if it uh, is better to be viewed that way. All right. So real quickly up at the top, and we'll go through this uh, in detail, and this is really the document and the presentation that will drive 
uh, many of our conversations over the coming weeks and months. Ultimately, this is a living document as uh, current budget information and as future budget information is known, uh, this document will evolve and we'll make sure that we track that uh, evolvement and uh, communicate that out as part of our campus conversations. So real quickly, starting up here at the top, and we'll use fiscal year 1920 as an example. So we'll run through fiscal year 1920 and then apply those same concepts to uh, the years to the right. Uh, so in fiscal year 1920, City College of San Francisco student-centered funding formula revenue uh, was 128 million. Our hold harmless revenue was 136 million. So as we all know, uh, districts get funded at the higher of the two numbers. The cost of living or the COLA increase was 3.26% in that year. And the FTES was approximately our 20,630 FTS with an instructional budget, our instructional FTF allocation of 1,396 FTEF. Jumping down, we have the revenues now at the top. Uh, we have our state apportionment, our educational protection, our Prop 30, uh, our enrollment fees, our local property taxes. Uh, that gets us to a total computational revenue or a TCR number. And then a deficit factor is applied. So the deficit factor is the state of California or the chancellor's office uh, having the ability to withdraw or withhold revenue. Uh, based on the cyclical nature of the state's revenue cycle. So they give us a cost of living increase at the beginning of the year. Uh, throughout that year, uh, revenue forecast and revenue collections change. So that deficit factor uh, is applied uh, in situations where the state initially uh, commits to a revenue allocation for the entire uh, Prop 98, uh, but then ultimately based on revenue collections, uh, has the ability to uh, reduce the amount that the uh, districts or the uh, agencies actually receive. So then we have our adjusted computational revenue. Um, and then jumping down, we have our parcel tax, our sales tax, our lottery. Uh, K through 14 agencies receive funding uh, when our California residents play the California lottery. We receive a portion of that funding. Uh, we have our mandated costs, our non-resident tuition. Uh, we have other uh, revenue sources. And then we have our transfers in, and this is primarily our stimulus funding. So you won't see anything uh, in 1920, obviously because we were pre-pandemic. And then we have our total unrestricted revenue. So I'm looking at a ballpark number. Um, this is the collection of all of our operational revenue, our unrestricted general fund as well as our parcel tax fund. Uh, so in 1920, uh, we were at about $181 million of operational funding. Jumping down to the expenditure side, uh, we have our academic salaries, our administrative salaries, our classified salaries. Uh, we have our collective uh, employee benefits as well as our OPEB, other post-employment benefit cost. We have supplies and materials. These are our 4,000s, our pens, our paper, our printer ink. Uh, we have our other operating. These are our utilities, uh, professional service agreements. And then we have our capital outlay. This is our tangible physical equipment, uh, such as desks, chairs, uh, computers, and so on. And then we have our other outgo, our transfers out. Uh, these are funds that come into the general fund or the parcel tax fund that get transferred to uh, a different fund of the district. Uh, so in looking at our 1920 year, uh, our total uh, spend was $183 million. Uh, and down below, we have the reconciliation of our beginning and ending uh, fund balances. So to start the 1920 year, our beginning fund balance was 10.2 million. Uh, we had a, an adjustment to that fund balance of 39,000. Uh, we had a surplus or a deficit uh, of 1.5 million. So this line right here, the surplus or deficit is the difference between our revenues and our expenditures for that year. And then we sum up uh, the beginning balance, any adjustments, 
and the surplus and or deficit to calculate a net fund ending balance. So I'm looking at 2019-20, parcel tax and general fund or U fund combined, uh, we had a net ending fund balance of about $8.6 million, 8.7. Uh, of that amount, uh, we had a prepaid asset, our mission lease. Uh, so several years ago, uh, the district made a substantial payment uh, to lease uh, the mission site uh, for an extended amount of time. Uh, so that is not necessarily cash, that is an asset, but based on our accounting requirements, uh, we record it as part of fund balance. And as you can see, uh, the difference between our prepaid asset amount and our net fund balance was a negative uh, $1 million. So we are in a position of negative uh, cash balance. Uh, for a negative unreserved, or excuse me, a negative uh, cash reserve balance of about uh, negative 0.62%. Uh, in this year, uh, 1920, uh, we also borrowed uh, 10.5 million from uh, our city uh, irrevocable OPEB trust. So San Francisco Community College District, as well as other uh, public agencies in our county, uh, all contribute to this one uh, irrevocable uh, OPEB trust. And uh, we did have to withdraw money from the city uh, in the tune of approximately 10.5 million during the 1920 year. Uh, in looking at uh, 2021, uh, it's the same concept moving forward as well as 21, 22 and 22, 23. So I'll stop there and uh, let that uh, sink in and we will actually move forward to uh, our current year and then our budget year uh, in looking at next year as well. All right, so now we're back up here at the top and in looking at uh, the year that we are uh, finalizing the audit on, 2020-21, uh, uh, the year that we're currently in now, 21-22, and then next budget year, 22-23, uh, uh, the next five or 10 minutes will focus primarily on uh, these three columns. So as you can see in 21, 20, or excuse me, 2021, uh, we had a 2.35% COLA. In 21-22, we had a 5.707% COLA. And in 22-23, we're projecting, or the state is projecting a 5.33% COLA. Uh, as you can see, our enrollment, uh, we are uh, projecting uh, that it remains consistent uh, through 22-23 and beyond. We'll get to that in just a second. And then our instructional budget uh, FTEF. Uh, in 2021, it was 1,880. Uh, in the current year, it's 1,100. And we are projecting uh, based on uh, the March 15th process and the preliminary schedule development, we will be at approximately 1,043 uh, instructional FTEF uh, moving forward. So how does that generate or fall into the revenue categories? Well, if we wanna take a look at the cost of living increases, uh, so the 5.07% COLA that we're getting in this year uh, is reflective of the increase from the 135 to the 141. And then looking at the 5.33% projected for next year, that would impact the increase of 141 million to 149. Uh, we are projecting uh, next year about 19.5 million in parcel tax, about 14.5 million in sales tax. And you'll notice that that's a significant increase from the previous two years. And the reason for that is, is that our sales tax uh, has been impacted by the pandemic. So the amount we've actually collected is far less than what our average would be in a normal year. So our HERAF funds or our stimulus funds allows us to bridge or close that gap to make sure our three-year average uh, is held consistent during the pandemic time. So you see these transfers in down here, a portion of that is to close the gap or to bridge the gap between what was actually collected 
and our three-year average of approximately 14.5, 14.6 million. Uh, we are, and jumping back now to 22, 23, and I hope I'm not moving uh, too sporadically through the document, but hopefully the colors uh, help a bit. Uh, we're still looking at the gray column. Uh, we are projecting uh, non-resident tuition of about 4.3 million. Uh, and then we have our other revenue sources of about 630 or 630,000, uh, as well as our other ongoing. So this is the uh, collection of uh, other revenues that we collect here at City College. So in looking at a budget uh, projection or a budget expectation, uh, we are projecting a total revenue of about $194 million for 22-23. One of the differences that we're going to uh, you know, look at uh, moving forward is that uh, in the most recent and past budget iterations, uh, the revenue and the expenditure numbers have held or accounted for the state's pass-through uh, for the retirement pensions of our employees, uh, the STRS uh, on behalf from the state of California. Uh, that's seven million that comes into the college, and then seven million that directly goes into the state stirs pot. So that's not actual cash that hits our books, but it is something that we're mindful of because the state makes a contribution to stirs on behalf of our employees. Uh, so the budget that we're looking at uh, does not include that state payment because ultimately it's not cash uh, to the district but it's cash on behalf of the district that's given to the state of California. So hopefully that made sense and I, we can dive into that uh, in the future if needed. All right, so now jumping down to our expenditure projections. Uh, so I'm looking at 22-23 uh, and in comparison with our current year, uh, as we know, we are currently in 21-22 and our uh, salaries for our faculty and administrative uh, employees uh, have been reduced on a one-year concession agreement. Uh, that's reflective in these numbers. So we are looking at 22-23 now. Uh, we are projecting uh, an increase of academic salaries to about 64.3. Uh, we are hoping that step and column movement uh, goes into place. Uh, and then we also are projecting uh, the need to hire uh, new full-time faculty. Uh, the administrative salaries, so we are restoring uh, the salaries, uh, same with the uh, faculty. Uh, so we do are projecting a administrative salary line of about 5.9 or $6 million. Uh, classified salaries are going to go from 39 to 37. Uh, the reason for the reduction is the uh, layoff notices that were enacted uh, in January. Uh, but then the also accounting for the increases in step movement, as well as the positions that we need to hire uh, in the coming years. So that is why uh, the delta between the 39 and the 37 uh, is not the full 4 million or so in savings that we uh, are going to achieve through the reduction of staffing uh, that occurred in January. Our employee benefits are going to go from 54.6 uh, to 56 uh, million. Uh, the reason for the approximate 1.5 million uh, increase or 1.6 million increase is that uh, in the governor's January budget proposal, the STRS uh, pension rate is scheduled to increase uh, about two percentage points. Uh, in addition, our OPEB pay-as-you-go cost, we have current retirees that are uh, accessing uh, health benefits and uh, post-employment benefits. Uh, so that payment, that year-over-year -year cost uh, does increase. So we are factoring in uh, that increase, as well as factoring in uh, the expectation that the cost of providing uh, health care uh, and health insurance uh, will go up on a per-employee basis. Uh, those three increases are brought down uh, or decreased uh, with the expect expectation that we do have a, a fewer number of employees potentially uh, participating in our healthcare program. Uh, and all of that is kind of wrapped up into uh, the employee benefits section of this projection.
And then we have our supplies and materials, our other operating, our capital outlay, and our other outgo uh, for a total projected spend of $194 million. Uh, so this is, uh, for all uh, intents and purposes and not tied out to the penny, uh, an initial projection at putting together a balanced budget for City College moving forward. Uh, you'll take a note that we have a, uh, another year of large um, other outgo, and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but I wanted to plant that seed because we'll speak directly to that number here in the coming moments. So jumping now to our fund balance calculations, I do want to uh, jump back to 2122 uh, as to where we're at today. Uh, we are expecting a uh, fund balance, uh, beginning fund balance of about 14.9 million. Uh, we still have to finalize the 2021 audit report, so that number will become definitive here in the next week. Uh, but where we're at today, we are projecting uh, about a 14.9 million beginning fund balance. Uh, we do have an adjustment or an increase of about 8.1 million. And the reason for that, uh, as I'm sure uh, we all may be aware of, is that part of uh, this 10.2 million transfer out above uh, was to transfer 8.1 million of cash into our reserves uh, so we can increase and make progressive steps forward to the 5% cash reserve requirement uh, by the state chancellor's office and our accrediting agencies. So we are uh, projecting that 8.1 million increase. Uh, we are also projecting a deficit. Uh, if you take the two, uh, the 186 in revenue above and the 191 of estimated expenses below, uh, that equates to approximately a 5.1 million estimated uh, deficit in the current year. Uh, structurally, you have to uh, add the two because it's a bit trickier nuance because we're taking cash out and putting it aside, which is impacting that surplus deficit number. So you have to net the two to get a true operational uh, sense as to where we're at for 21-22. So right now we are currently uh, expecting about a $3 million surplus in the current year. Uh, that surplus, uh, as we know, is built on the expectation or the assumption uh, that our salary concessions and the savings that we will generate for the second half of this year based on the staffing reductions in our classified uh, continuously hold true. Uh, so the adjustments that we're uh, reducing our salaries and reducing our staffing uh, have re resulted in uh, an approximately $3 million surplus. So let's jump down to the, the last few lines. So we are projecting a net fund balance, ending fund balance of about 17.9 million. Uh, once again, of that 17.9 million, uh, about 9.3 million of it is the prepaid asset uh, for the mission center. And the delta is about 8.5 million in cash. Uh, so to calculate the reserve balance, we are looking at about a 4.97 or a 5% cash reserve uh, if these assumptions hold true through the remainder of the 21-22 a year. Uh, I'll pause there and we will focus more now on 22-23. So jumping back to the gray column, uh, as we've discussed and communicated out to the campus, uh, we are uh, building this budget under the assumption that we fully restore uh, our salaries for our, all our faculty members, as well as our administrators. Uh, but we are building the, this budget under the assumption that we are going to move forward with uh, issuing uh, 50 or approximately 50 uh, March 15th notices uh, to our faculty and uh, reducing our administrative uh, team uh, by about five positions. Uh, so it'll be about a 55 uh, total uh, position elimination, but adding back salary restoration uh, for those positions or for those uh, employee groups uh, are factored into the 64 million and the 5.9 or 6 million for faculty and administrative budgets. Uh, so real quickly, uh, based on 
uh, the projections or the initial pass at a 22-23 budget. Uh, we are projecting, uh, as I mentioned, a, a relatively balanced budget, uh, which would get us to a fund balance of about 18.1 million uh, if we have a $236,000 uh, surplus, uh, which would get us above or at that 5% cash reserve uh, floor. Uh, once again, that, that is a number or a percentage that uh, is used by the Chancellor's Office, as well as other agencies, such as our accreditation agency and as our FICMAT agency, uh, as an identification or a floor a benchmark for the amount of cash reserves that a district needs to have uh, at any one given time. Uh, the statewide average changes uh, every year, uh, but the last time that uh, comprehensive report was done, uh, the statewide average was between 20 and 25% of cash reserves. So we are uh, behind the statewide average, uh, but that statewide average uh, is higher uh, than what the floor is uh, recommended by uh, the agencies that, uh, that we work with. So in looking at how to progressively move forward and put together a projection or a budget moving forward, we're going to jump back up here to the top. And I am mindful that we want time for questions and answers. So we'll go through this, uh, uh, not rather quickly, but uh, maybe in a little bit less detail. So in looking at 23, 24, 24, 25, 25, 26, and 26, 27. So looking at next year and the subsequent four years, so a five-year outlook. Uh, there's a hundred assumptions that go into this. Uh, they will change uh, and we'll talk about these assumptions, uh, but for the sake of a preliminary conversation, uh, hopefully this provides some context as to a pathway forward for City College. And looking at the projected uh, student-centered funding revenue numbers, as well as the hold harmless revenue numbers, if our FTS stays consistent at about 16,100, uh, it will impact uh, our revenue numbers as mentioned above. So we will continue to be a hold harmless district. Uh, in looking at fiscal year uh, 23, 24 as an example, our hold harmless amount or the delta of uh, the student-centered funding formula and hold harmless is approximately $10 million. And I think an important concept uh, that we need to work through as a campus is really uh, defining and uh, understanding what growth is. Uh, we have uh, FTES growth, but we also have revenue growth. And uh, to close the $10 million hold harmless uh, delta, that amount, we do need an approximate 20 to 25% increase in FTES. If we got to that point, uh, the student-centered funding formula revenue would then become the higher number of the two. So for example, if we were to grow 25% next year and FTS were to go to arbitrarily uh, 25,000 FTS, that 154, that hold harmless amount would stay the same, but that increase to 25,000 FTS would significantly increase our student-centered funding formula revenue to where that number would now become the higher of these two. So City College would be funded on the higher. Uh, so when we talk about growth, and I think it's important that as we move forward with these types of conversations, uh, FTS growth is absolutely something that we want to be mindful of and we want to put things in place to allow that to happen. But from a revenue standpoint in the funding formula concept, we could grow two to 3,000 FTS next year. So we could go from 16,000 to 18,000. Our student-centered funding formula will not increase to the level that it would exceed our hold harmless funding. So we would still be a hold harmless district. So it's an important conversation, in my opinion, uh, to recognize and understand that we could have an increase in FTES, but based under the hold harmless formula, that increase in FTES, those additional students that come here 
uh, would not generate additional revenue based on the current formula or the current model. So there's the FTS growth, but then also the revenue growth and those growth uh, buckets uh, may not be uh, parallel based on the, the current funding formula. So that's something that I think will be an important part of our conversations moving forward. So real quickly, uh, jumping back into uh, the outlook or the future years, starting with the light blue, uh, we did pull the estimated cost of living adjustments from uh, the school services uh, dashboard. Uh, the school services is an agency that uh, works with K through 14 districts to project uh, outward year COLAs. So those are projections and as we all know, uh, subject to change. Um, down below, as I mentioned, we are in an initial uh, thought process or an initial pass at a outlook, uh, just assuming that FTS remains consistent, that we hold at 16,100 FTS. Uh, we will, in future iterations of these conversations, look at, well, what happens if we go to 17,000? What happens if we go to 18,000? Uh, we will be prepared and have uh, information to have those dialogues. But for an initial first conversation, looking at baseline or looking at a foundational uh, concept that we can depend on uh, moving forward. And then we have our instructional FTEF. Uh, so as you can see, what we are projecting and what we hope to do is that after uh, the 22-23 year, uh, we start adding uh, and growing our instructional schedule uh, to hopefully increase uh, instructional opportunities and the FTEF. So based on the budget projections below, uh, it's under the assumption that in 23-24, we jump from 1,043 uh, to 1,061, to 1,080, to almost 1,100. And then down here at the bottom or to the far right uh, is a scenario that I hope we don't get to. Um, that is where the hold harmless uh, goes into uh, full effect. As we know, the 24-25 year is the last year of hold harmless. So in 25-26, we would, as the way the legislation is written today, uh, we would effectively lose the hold harmless amount and be funded on the 133 million. So it would no longer be the higher of the two. It would strictly be our student-centered funding formula. In the governor's January proposal, uh, there was legislation or was a concept proposed that would extend hold harmless and that's why I left these numbers here just for context, uh, is that these numbers would become the baseline moving forward. So in 25-26, if the proposal that's in the January budget gets written into law and gets funded and doesn't get changed over the next several years, uh, City College and every other district can hold harmless would now have the floor or their baseline become the 159 million moving forward. Uh, that's obviously uh, something that uh, is going to evolve and change throughout legislative conversations. Uh, but just to illustrate what it would look like if the way it's written in the law today uh, were to unfold over the next several years, uh, that significant decreases in revenue would cause us uh, to potentially need an instructional FTF about 770 uh, to get to a balanced budget. So down here at the bottom, and, and hold on to that thought because down here at the bottom is kind of how we see that uh, playing out in regards to our total expenditures. Uh, so jumping here in the 23-24 year, uh, we are uh, about 191 million. And then we see expenditures increasing. And part of the reason why we see our projecting expenditures increasing uh, is because we want to have a step and column movement. Uh, we want to hire uh, new employees and we want to offer larger academic uh, opportunities in regards to instructional courses and classes and sections. And those increases are factored in here. Um, and then down below, as you can see, 
uh, everything remaining consistent, uh, we would slowly start to build reserves, uh, not only to address uh, the accreditation uh, process, not only to address our audit findings, uh, but also put us in a position to where if hold harmless does come into effect and we do lose uh, that $10 million buffer, uh, we have the opportunity to take a, a relatively uh, large uh, decrease in one year, uh, but then ultimately stabilize the college or balance the budget uh, in the second year and keep us above that 5% cash reserves. Uh, real quickly, and just to reiterate, there's a, a line of assumptions that go into these multi-year projections. Uh, we hope we don't have to get here. Uh, there's current uh, language in the January proposal that would help us not to get to this situation. Uh, but it is something that I want us to, to be mindful of and be a part of the conversation because as the way the law is written today, uh, we would see that significant decrease in revenue in 25, 26, 26, 27. Uh, so as I mentioned up here at the top, uh, getting to that 772 uh, instructional FTF, uh, we're a different institution at that point. That is a place none of us wants to go, uh, but based on uh, the calculations and, and the assumptions is that that's where we would need to be to balance a budget where hold harmless gets uh, taken away and we are funded strictly on our student-centered funding formula and our FTS uh, remains consistent. So there are assumptions built into that. And that is why I think as a system uh, advocating for a change and continuous reform in the student-centered funding formula model uh, is something that needs to be on the forefront of not only City College, uh, but our, our system as a whole. Uh, real quickly, and I know I'm jumping around, I, I just uh, I appreciate the opportunity to walk through the, this. And as I mentioned, we will look at these numbers on a variety of different platforms and committees uh, throughout the semester. But I did want to touch base on the uh, transfer out or the other outgo in 22-23. Uh, so there is a significant uh, dollar amount that we are planning to transfer out uh, of the unrestricted general fund and the parcel tax fund. That number uh, is built into uh, the assumptions here and have a little bit more detail as to what makes up that number. So in 22-23, that 12.3 million uh, is made up of about $8 million transfer to our self-insurance fund. Uh, over the last uh, few years, we have overdrawn uh, our self-insurance fund. Uh, and prior to our accreditation visit, we need to uh, balance that fund and balance those books uh, to eliminate uh, the deficit that currently exists in that fund. At the end of 2021, we're at approximately $4 million. In 21-22 will be approximately a $6 million deficit. It's about two, two and a half million deficit each year. And then in 23-24, uh, in order to close the deficit from the years past and fund the current year activity, uh, we are looking at approximately an $8 million transfer to the self-insurance fund. Uh, same concept with our cafeteria and bookstore funds. Uh, but a much smaller amount, approximately 1.5 million. And then uh, as we know, we are still uh, in the process of repaying uh, our apportionment to the state uh, from several years back. So there is the assumption that that repayment will continue. And then moving forward into the subsequent years, you'll see a smaller or a uh, less of a transfer out uh, of 6.8 and then seven. Uh, the breakdown there is built in uh, to the assumption model here. Uh, the reason for the slight increase is that in looking at uh, making contributions back to the trust uh, for OPEB to repay the funds that we withdrew over these two years, uh, because health benefits and those costs uh, increase year over year or have increased year over year, uh, we are uh, initially projecting an increase of funding of approximately 250000 each year. So in any given year, uh, for simplicity, it would be $1 million this year, $1,250,000 uh, 
1,500,000 and so on. So that uh, is hopefully some context as to the transfers and why you see increases in the outreach. Uh, real quick, this is, uh, you know, based on a variety of assumptions. One of the assumptions uh, and uh, being very direct is uh, that we, we aren't having any uh, salary increases or we haven't built in any salary increases. Uh, as we know, uh, our contract with our uh, faculty labor partners um, is up for uh, a discussion or a potential uh, three-year uh, renewal, our three-year new contract. Our classified contract with our classified uh, labor partners uh, expires at the end of uh, this uh, fiscal year, so June 30th of 2022. Uh, so we absolutely want to be in a position to where we are uh, able to have uh, serious discussions about providing raises, uh, giving salary increases. Uh, that is something that we need to uh, find a way uh, to move the needle on. Uh, because as we know, uh, in the last, uh, or in the current fiscal year, and then projecting out in the next fiscal year, we are uh, in a position to where uh, we are in a year where everybody, I've got a 5% COLA throughout the state. Uh, City College had to uh, work through salary concessions in this year. Uh, so the positioning of our salary schedules uh, with comparable districts, uh, we've lost ground in my opinion. Uh, we don't want to continue that trend. So it's imperative that we uh, continue to find ways to not only meet uh, the budget expectations of uh, the governing board and our board policies, meet the minimum cash reserve balances, uh, get through a successful accreditation uh, visit here in the next year, uh, but also find a way to build in uh, salary uh, increases because our employees uh, deserve those and we have to find a way to make that happen. Uh, but real quickly, and we will have some extra time for questions, uh, so I, I don't want to eat up uh, all of our question and answer time, but just focusing once again on our 22-23 year, and we'll go through it uh, one more time because this is really the primary focus of the next uh, several months, is uh, once again, we are projecting a uh, FTS remains consistent that we, we hold uh, at 16,100. Uh, we are uh, projecting that we will be a hold harmless uh, district uh, once again. Uh, so we will be funded on the hold harmless amount. So that 150 uh, will be our uh, revenue amount. Uh, we are budgeting for an instructional FTF of approximately 1,043. And then based on uh, those assumptions, uh, we are projecting a a total computational revenue of about 149 million, a total revenue of about 194 million. Uh, you'll notice that as of right now, our stimulus funds and our ability to backfill any lost revenue or supplement any of our expenditures with those stimulus funds, it ends on June 30th of this year. Uh, so the way uh, the stimulus package is written today uh, we will not have access uh, to those funds in 22-23. Jumping down, uh, the expectation that we fully restore uh, all of our salaries are the salaries of our uh, faculty employee groups and our administrative employee groups. Uh, that goes into the $64 million uh, budget for academic salaries. Um, that we restore our administrative salaries, but have a reduction of approximately five positions goes into the uh, 6 million budget line item. Our classified salaries uh, will uh, be about 37.1 million. Our benefits will be about 56 million. And then we will also have to build in a, a reduction of our uh, operational or our discretionary funds. So in order to build a balanced budget, uh, we are projecting the need to decrease our supplies and materials, our other operating by about a million, uh, our capital outlay. And then we will need to make those transfers as part of uh, preparing for uh, an accreditation visit to ensure that we meet the standards uh, and ultimately 
uh, falling short of those standards would require uh, the potential for a follow-up visit and other circumstances uh, that I don't think we want to be a part of. We want to do uh, the, the needed uh, adjustments to our negative fund balances that currently exist in our financial statements uh, so then we can move forward uh, and, and move past uh, the current deficits that we have uh, in several of our funds uh, throughout our books and records in their entirety. Uh, we are projecting uh, a two hundred thirty-six million thirty two hundred thirty-six thousand dollars surplus, which would get us to a cash reserve balance of about eight point nine nine million dollars, which would get us above and keep us uh, at a five percent cash reserve, and then building projections moving forward that would increase that cash reserve uh, for potential use in. Uh, salary negotiations or to build a buffer or to build a uh, savings account. So if and when hold harmless impacts us negatively, uh, we can weather that storm and, and not have uh, a significant uh, change in any one given year. Uh, so that is uh, at a high level, uh, the five-year projections, as I mentioned, this will be an ongoing conversation. Uh, I will stop uh, sharing the screen now, and we will have uh, plenty of time for questions and comments, but we will start with uh, Zoom hands, and let me stop sharing so we can uh, see everybody. And we will, uh, let me pull up the participants, and I will start with uh, raised Zoom hands, and the first one that I see is uh, Abigail. Thank you. So um, I was just, I'm hoping you can clarify something that I just don't have knowledge of. And um, it's that 12.3 million outlay. Um, I was a little bit confused by that. You referred to needing to use 8 million of it for the self-insurance. Could you explain what is the self-insurance? What, what is it that we're insured for? Or what is that used for? And then does the remaining... 4 million mean that you're just adding that into the reserves? Is that why it's 12.3 million? I don't, under, I don't understand that number. Great, and, and thank you for the question. And maybe uh, in being a, a bit more specific and looking at the self-insurance fund, uh, is that uh, City College of San Francisco and every other district uh, in the state has multiple funds designated for a specific purpose. So our self-insurance fund uh, is for our property and liability uh, insurance, uh, as well as other miscellaneous insurance or student insurance and uh, different types of uh, insurance that we cover um, as a community college district with nine locations. Uh, that fund itself uh, needs to be supplemented with uh, revenue. So when insurance uh, premiums or invoices come, uh, we have revenue to pay those expenses uh, when they come due. Uh, approximately two or three years ago, uh, the transfer of revenue to that fund uh, stopped. So the insurance uh, invoices kept coming, but there was no revenue to offset it. So the fund uh, started to withdraw or become in a deficit state. Uh, so right now the fund in its uh, in its singular self or looking at it just as a singular fund has a negative uh, balance of approximately $4 million. Part of the accreditation review is that all of our funds are in a positive balance. And one of our, our uh, audit findings is that uh, our self-insurance fund, or we have funds that have deficit balances in them. So I hope that provides some context and what the transfers are doing is it's eliminating that deficit balance. It's making sure that those accounts or those funds are no longer withdrawn or overdrawn. Uh, so therefore, when we turn in our financial statements uh, to the auditors and to our accreditation agency, uh, we don't have negative funds uh, throughout our books and records. Uh, the same concept with our cafeteria and bookstore funds. So those large transfers are uh, correcting uh, what is currently an overdrawn fund here at the district. So I hope that provided some more information. 
All right. All right. I see Dana Jay's hands up and then Ronald, you're in the queue. Thank you. And thank you so much for the in-depth analysis here, which is incredibly helpful. Um, I wonder on the expenditure side between 2020 and 2020, 2021-22, the employee benefits seem to have gone up 14 million between those two. I can, I can understand small increases, 2 million throughout the rest of the budget, but I'm curious about the jump to four, from 14 million. Uh, great question, uh, Dan Jane. I apologize for missing that uh, in my presentation is that we are not, or the district did not withdraw uh, funding from the trust. So ultimately that one-time funding that was withdrawn to cover that balance in 21, 22, or 2021, that had to be added into the employee benefit budget of the current fiscal year and moving forward because those trust funds are one-time funds. So the difference or the delta is the uh, increase or the need to cover those OPEB costs because we're not making a withdrawal from the city trust in the current year. Thank you for the question. Thank you. All right, I see Ronald, your hand up. So, so you're muted, sir. Okay, there we go. All right, I wasn't able to unmute myself. So um, yes, I have a couple of questions. One, I, I heard you say that we are projecting a need to hire more full-time, but I also heard that we are planning to lay off 50 full-time employees. And that also implies uh, 300, uh, approximately 300 part-timers being not rehired. And one, I would like some kind of acknowledgement about the, 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 the pain that that is causing to people. My, my job is one of those on the line. You also um, said something about that an increase in FTES would not increase revenue in the hold homeless. That worries me that you are that the message you are saying is that there's no incentive to increase enrollment, and and so that's why it's okay to continue to cut classes, which causes enrollment to fall, which causes us to cut more classes, which causes enrollment to fall, leading us into a death spiral that is going to jeopardize all of our jobs. Thank you. I appreciate the question, Ronald, and I'll, I'll try and respond uh, to both questions uh, separately. So uh, the, the, the assumption that's built into the out years of hiring uh, new full-time faculty, uh, that is something that I believe uh, is part of uh, you know, the path forward to say that we are going to go four or five years or any district were to go uh, several years without hiring a new, new full-time faculty in areas uh, of demand as identified through our prioritization process. Uh, that's not something that, that I believe is, is realistic. So I, I understand that in the current year, uh, we are uh, recommending the uh, issuance of approximately 50 uh, March 15th notices. But then also in looking at the next five years or defining a path forward, uh, to uh, sit here under the assumption that we won't need or, or we won't uh, have demand to hire or support new full-time faculty over the next five years. Uh, I don't think that's a realistic assumption. So I do think that needs to be built into uh, the out years moving forward. Uh, in regards to the question or the comments re in respects to the FTES and the revenue, I think that's a great conversation. I think you make a valid point, Ronald, in the sense that as we look at growth, it's really making sure that we're defining it, but being mindful that FTS growth, as we traditionally have seen it in the budget side, uh, may not equate to an increase of revenue at that specific time. So that's not to say we don't want to grow or we don't need to put things in place to grow. It's just being mindful that based on the current formula, if we are to grow and we are to put things in place to grow, if that cost extra expenditures or if that costs extra funds, that might not equate to an additional source of revenue based on the current model. So I hope that uh, responded in some part to your question, but I think the concept of defining growth and being mindful that enrollment growth is something we absolutely uh, want to explore and find ways to achieve 
but doing so under the expectation or the assumption that that may not equivalent, equate to uh, increased revenue at this given point in time, I think is part of the conversation that we need to have as a campus. Uh, so thank you for your question, uh, Ron. All right, now jump into uh, David Pipe. Uh, yes, I wanted to follow up on the employee benefits. If the OPEB withdrawals in the past two years were one time uh, withdrawals and need to be made up and redeposited back in, why does it become that $10 million become an ongoing part of the budget going years into the future? Uh, because once the one time withdrawals have been replenish, then you wouldn't seem like you would need to keep replenishing that same amount every year indefinitely. Uh, thank you for the, the question. So the, 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 the OPEB withdrawal uh, was to cover the year's cost. So we incur each year ongoing approximately 10 million or so of ongoing OPEB pay-as-you-go expense. So we have retirees that are getting those benefits and we get an invoice every year uh, to pay those benefits. Uh, in the years past, when that invoice came in, instead of using our ongoing revenue to pay that invoice, we pulled from our city's trust to pay that invoice. Uh, so ultimately the expenditure is uh, ongoing and will continue to be ongoing uh, into the indefinite future. Uh, the reason that we're building it into our structural budget is because the city trust funds uh, have uh, dwindled. Uh, those funds are one time. So our ability to pull 10 million out of that trust every year moving forward uh, will ultimately not be possible. So we have to build those annual ongoing pay-as-you-go costs into our operational expenditures uh, because pulling from the trust uh, to cover those costs each year uh, is, is not a, a viable path for it. So thank you for the question, David, and I hope that responded. And real quickly, I, I will uh, try and get through, through all the questions. And I know uh, if there are uh, follow-up, if there is follow-up, or if I did not respond fully to your question, uh, you can send me an email uh, and we may have some time here to do some follow-up, but I'm going to try and get through all the questions uh, that we have. So thank you for your understanding. All right, Tahilma, you're up. Tamina. Tamina, I'm proud. Okay, hi, David, thank you. Um, so I, I teach in the English department. I am a part-timer and I am one of the approximately 300 uh, part-time faculty who will necessarily lose my job if these layoffs go through. What are your plans to bring revenue to the college? My plans in regards to uh, bringing revenue, it's identifying uh, where the demand is. It's putting structures in place to meet that demand. And it's really leveraging our educational master plan, our enrollment management plan uh, to, to develop those pathways or to enhance those pathways. Uh, off the top of my head, I know we have opportunities in dual enrollment. Uh, there are opportunities in different types of partnerships to uh, bring back and potentially expand uh, some of our older adult programs, uh, but really looking at uh, where the demand is and making sure that we have resources available uh, to meet that demand. That is how uh, we're going to grow, and that demand is going to change. That's going to evolve, uh, but ultimately, we have uh, campus and uh, board-approved plans. It's now funding those plans and enacting those plans, and then evaluating whether or not we're moving the needle. If we're not, uh, we need to then reevaluate those plans. So thank you for the question. I think the concept of enrollment growth uh, and planning for uh, enrollment growth is a really important conversation, and we need to have that alongside our budget conversations when we're looking at uh, our, our resource availability. So thank you. All right, Ryan, I see your hand up. Hi, I'm just as an interested community member um, and a researcher in economics, I've got a question for you regarding the budgetary figures. I noticed that from 2020 to 2021 versus 2021 to 2022, the other outlays jumps from approximately $790,000 to just over $10 million, which is easily double 
the size of the deficit. And as per state law, if there were things like construction projects or what have you, those would be listed in other places in the budget. So I guess what my question is, is what is that nine and a half million dollars of unitemized money for? Sure, I appreciate the question, Ryan. So if I may uh, share the screen one more time so we can take a look at it together. And I think, Ryan, if I understood your question correctly, you are referencing the increase that we see uh, from 790,000 to 10.2 and then 12.3, uh, and then ultimately settling about 6.8, uh, so on, moving forward. So in 2020-21, uh, the district did not uh, transfer uh, any funds uh, out of the general fund or the parcel tax fund to its other operational funds. Uh, because those funds were kept in uh, the general fund for operational purposes. So what that did uh, was it created a situation where other funds uh, started overdrawing their accounts, which created negative balances uh, in different sets of our books and records. So the increase that you see in 21-22 uh, to 10.2 million, that's the increase to set eight million aside to uh, increase our cash reserves, because uh, we were at or are projected to be at below the five percent floor for cash reserves, which would impact uh, potentially our accreditation status and/or our ability to fix or correct our ongoing audit findings. So that uh, accounts for the increase you see in 21-22 is to put cash aside to increase the amount of available cash we have in our bank account. In 22-23, that increases again because we not only have to make sure we keep the 5% uh, reserve minimum intact, but we have to transfer the funds out to the self-insurance fund back to our OPEB trust uh, to our cafeteria funds, all of those accounts that we've been overdrawing uh, the last several years, uh, we need to put the funds back in order to prepare for an accreditation visit. Part of the accreditation visit is to look at each fund separately uh, to ensure we don't have uh, overdrawn accounts. Uh, in addition, we do have to clear and address all of our ongoing audit findings. And part of our audit findings is uh, are uh, having uh, several funds that are overdrawn and currently have a negative uh, balance. So those are the, uh, or that is the intent of those transfers. Uh, so thank you for the question. All right, we are uh, 10 minutes past the hour. So we, uh, if you have a question, I'd be more than happy to stay um, as long as, as it takes to get through these questions. So please uh, don't hesitate and I appreciate the engagement. All right, Patricia. Um, hi, first of all, uh, forgive me if you covered this already because I was coming from someone, someplace else. So no one trusts, so let me explain. I walk in multiple spaces and one thing is consistently true. No one trusts us to manage money, period, point blank. So it seems to me like we need a way to independently verify any numbers that comes officially from City College. And the other thing it seems to me is our only path forward, given the fact that no one wants to give us money and trust us, is to increase student enrollment. But that seems not to be our focus. So my ask chancellor is how do we address these things and correct them? the fact that no one trusts us and we need inter, in, independent, and, and let me say in the trust, let me uh, spread the blame. Not just your numbers, but other numbers people produce too. So it's like, who's right, who's right? So we need some independent stuff. And um, yeah, so I'll be quiet now. Well, I appreciate the question. And um, in, in responding to how can we be in a position to where uh, our numbers, uh, both internally and externally, become trustworthy. Uh, I think we are uh, not unlike any other district that goes through an internal, uh, external, uh, independent audit. The complications that I think that build, uh, you know, the sense of mistrust is that uh, our audit reports uh, consistently have uh, findings uh, which question 
uh, the district's ability to be a uh, ongoing uh, entity that can operate uh, under its own uh, decision making. It's called the going concern finding. Uh, so it's very hard to uh, present um, projections or present the budget uh, that uh, one would find trustworthy if we have uh, several years of ongoing audit findings from an independent external auditor saying uh, the district uh, has not shown the ability to properly manage its ongoing structure. So that is something that I think we need to address. And we address it through these types of conversations in looking uh, five years ahead of us, putting a, a target as to where we want to be as an institution and how do we allocate resources to get there. I would love to, to sit here and, and do a presentation on being able to add uh, an indefinite amount of classes wherever uh, we wanted to. Uh, we unfortunately don't have the resources to do that at this point in time. So we have to be strategic and we have to allocate uh, in a way that, that meets the demand. So as we build this schedule, this budget and future years budget, I think it's getting to a point where we don't have external agencies constantly uh, pointing out uh, areas that we are not hitting the mark. And, and that's gonna be the first step in, in building trust. So I, I appreciate the question. And I think that's gonna be a big part in not only the conversations this semester, but moving forward is how do we get to a point where we can collectively as an institution look at financial numbers and use them to make collective decisions so we can move forward as an institution. So thank you for the question. All right, Francine, I see your hand up. Mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm I can hear you great, Francine. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, I'm a, a retiree, and um, one of the questions that has come up many times over years now, and this is before your time, in fairness, is every year we hear a projection of enrollment, a projection of FTES, but we don't really hear at the end, okay, we projected X, but what actually happened after we cut a bunch of classes, how, what happened at Y? How many bodies and what was the FTES? It would be really helpful to have a chart over years of time showing projection, how, you know, how many classes were cut, in this projection, and then how many FTEs did we actually achieve? Because I know this, this is different than a lot of the administrative perspectives, but it just seems to me that when you cut a whole bunch of classes, you get less enrollment. You, you know, it just is sadly true. People who come to the college to sign up for, I don't know, welding are not gonna take history instead because there was a space in it, either we're offering that class or we're not. And that then cuts into our FTES it seems. So do you have such a chart or could one be made of say the past 10 years of projection, actual FTES and how many classes were cut to reach that actual enrollment? Uh, that's a great point, Francine, and that's something that we can uh, put together. We have that data, and I think it would be great to uh, take the chart or the concept that we just looked at and maybe go back a few more years, uh, mm -hmm. because I know that uh, we were at one point, a, you know, much larger in regards to FTS, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I'm fairly certain that we were offering a larger instructional schedule at that time. So not only have we seen a decrease in FTS, uh, there has been a decrease in instructional offerings as well. Right. Uh, seeing that over time, I think would be a great addition to this uh, discussion. Uh, I was a bit hesitant to go too far back to provide too much uh, information all at once, but I think moving forward, maybe going back a few more years and looking at FTS, FTF, and how those uh, were related in some of the trends that we were seeing for both uh, instructional scheduling and FTS. I think that'd be a great yeah. value to this conversation. So thank you for those yeah. comments. Because we hear projection and there's a whole bunch of numbers. It used to be that anybody could go in and see what how the enrollment was doing. That I can't find that anywhere. 
And now it just, the, the projection versus the result is really what I'm seeking. You know, the administration said, if we do these things, if we cut a thousand sections and stuff, we will get an increase in FTES over here. But did we? And what was, you know, what was the thinking? And most people in the college and in the town think in 10 year terms. 2012 is when the world fell apart and things went up and down and mostly down. And here we are trying to fix problems that I appreciate you're trying to fix. Uh, but we, do, we, we think in that period of time, the city I believe does and the people who have worked at the college and who still work there, because that's how long this struggle has been ongoing. Thank you for those comments. Okay. All right, seeing the, the next hand, uh, Abigail, uh, Harry, you're in the queue, and then Patricia, uh, you're up next. So I think I missed something that maybe you could just clarify for me. When you started looking at the skiff versus the hold harmless, and I think it was in year 2025, it seemed like we were holding the FTEF steady, but for some reason it was showing a really large drop in skiff the potential and you know because but I was wondering what what made you think that it would all of a sudden drop that year versus you know I understand the very last year but that 2025 2026 uh, mm -hmm. notice it went from 24 it was 140 million 149 million then all of a sudden 133 million what's happening there uh, great question um, so that is uh, based on the implementation. So 133, 14. So we'll have to, to double check on that. Um, that is uh, a good question. That is in fiscal year 25, 26. Uh, that is a decrease uh, in, in the SCIF funding formula. So what I think the Excel chart, um, we, we can double check on that. Uh, and make sure we're, we're providing the right numbers. Um, so I'm trying to think of where we're at. So let me, we'll follow up on that. That's a good question. Thank you, Abigail. Because in 2526, uh, that is the year in which the hold harmless uh, revenues are uh, taken away. So we would, uh, based on the current legislation, uh, be funded on the uh, fewer, the less least amount of revenue. Uh, so we would want to double check where that 133 uh, is calculated from. Uh, so we'll, we can get back to you on that. Thank you for the question. All right. Next uh, hand, Harry. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Yes, thank you for doing this first installment. I, I think there will be, we expect there will be others. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you know, the, there's talk about looking for additional source of funding. Apparently the uh, state is really growing what it's planning to uh, offer or make available uh, to colleges but we're also looking at how money is being spent. So I wonder if you would commit to having a list of consultants that is just a list, um, because when this has come up before, it's been said uh, by people in the financial offices that that's just in the budget and it's just, you know, it's difficult to do it but it must be done because they're all being paid. So maybe a list of consultants, what it is they're doing, um, you know, what their main jobs are and how much it's costing uh, so that that can be evaluated. I know at least some consulting came about because uh, the college over time has shifted. Um, for instance, I think the bookstore was run by the college and now it's, uh, follow it. And uh, I'm not saying to reverse all of those, 
but maybe that's the direction that some people would like to to go just so we have a have something clear about where we are and we can figure out where to go on that thank you harry and i think that that's something we can absolutely commit to and looking at uh, the a discretionary expenditures of the district that I think is going to be very important, uh, especially if uh, we move forward uh, with some of the budget decisions uh, that are in front of us. So I, I acknowledge your comments and agree that we, we should be able to and would uh, benefit from uh, those types of conversations. So thank you. All right, Patricia. Hello. So. Um... There's an incredible brain trust at this organization, and I'm fortunate enough to be cross-sectioning in many different groups. And I've seen an alternative budget provided by AFT Union. I have seen great analysis of the FON from the full-time caucus. And I also have heard from you, um, speaking of community conversation and a collective action around a prioritization schedule, and also what we value. And so what I'm hearing today that is hopeful is that there is going to be an addressing of these other sources of information, as opposed to a delivering of the narrative to the general public and to the students that this is what's been decided and this how it's go how it's going to go. And as a theater um, professional, I can't help but think of Arthur Miller's famous dramatization of playing for time where uh, an orchestra within the death camps were asked to play music in order to extend the life. And I'm sorry to use that, that uh, metaphor, but that's how it feels. We're playing for time, whether you're a part-time or about to lose your job, whether you're a senior faculty who's going to lose some benefits you're expecting on, or if you're in my case, uh, one of the 50 full-time people and by the way, our department will cease to exist when it is reduced from a two person department to a one person department, it will cease to exist. And the uh, building of this expensive and prestige gathering theater space uh, will be an empty gesture that has already been funded by the public. So a little shout out to our, our group there of the 50 of us that are in absolute pain we want to trust your numbers. We want to trust this process. So that's my comment. Thank you. Mr. Thank you for your comments. All right. Uh, Diane. Um, thank you. Um, so, you know, it's unprecedented for City College to lay off full time faculty. We worked pretty hard last year to come to an agreement to prevent that. And I'm wondering what we can do to prevent these layoffs. I think um, it sends the wrong message. It's bad PR to be laying people off because that's showing that we're downsizing the college and that's really going to affect our enrollment. And so I'd like to know what we, could, what we can do to prevent these layoffs and keep our college growing in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Diane, for that question. And uh, in not wanting to, to overstep in regards to uh, conversations that uh, need to be had or, or should be had um, in uh, the, the framework of uh, discussions with our labor partners, um, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, overstep or, or say things that uh, would not be appropriate for me to do so. Uh, in looking at moving forward, uh, building a budget uh, that not only uh, gets us to a place where we can uh, meet the reserve expectations, uh, we can address all of our audit findings, and we can be in a place where we don't have uh, external agencies uh, constantly uh, year after year, uh, monitoring us and uh, issuing letters, uh, which we are constantly responding to. That is the place that we need to go, uh, in my opinion. And ultimately, we need to build a budget and look at our staffing to get us there. Uh, the 50 uh, March 15th notices is uh, a recommendation to do so. And that process 
uh, is going to work itself out. We will have a definitive path forward here in the next couple of weeks. And then if that uh, direction is uh, the one that we are moving in at that time, uh, then there may be opportunities to explore alternatives. But until that time uh, and until uh, any conversations are had uh, where, they, where they should and rightfully be had, uh, it would be uh, not appropriate for me to, to fully respond to that. So I, I hope that uh, is not an, uh, a disappointing response or an indirect response, but I do just want to respect the question, but also respect uh, our processes uh, outside of our, our group here this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, yes, Harry, uh, one more question. And then uh, I, we, we, we do have four minutes till 1.30. So any final questions, we'll go ahead and, and take. Yes, Harry. Uh, yes, so I've talked to people at uh, Monterey Peninsula College, and I realize they, they're not the same institution. Um, but from what I heard, you reached out to their um, faculty and said, we're, we're at a low, um, low pay rate, and I think we have opportunities for growth. And they're, they really wanted you to stay because you were such a positive um, influence on their instability. And um, you're looking at us, it seems to me, in a very different way. Um, there, there was a question of uh, the classified staff, and there were possibilities of not having cuts, but you pursued cuts. Um, just what uh, Patricia and other people asked, that there are alternatives now being proposed to avoid cuts or minimize them, and that's not the, headed, the direction you're headed in. Um, can we have the uh, chancellor who was at Monterey Peninsula College, who sees uh, sees us as a institution that should uh, grow not in five years from now, but now. I appreciate those comments here. Thank you. All right, real quick, I see Simon's hand up, but I did want to jump back uh, to a previous question uh, as I was had too many documents open up at once. Uh, so I want to respond to the previous question uh, regarding uh, the uh, 25, 26 to hold harmless reduction in revenue. I believe it was Abigail uh, that uh, asked the question. So let me pull up the screen again. And I apologize for not being uh, David on the spot, but that I was flipping through a couple different documents. So the question is, if I remember correctly, why did we, or why are we projecting a decrease in the student-centered funding formula uh, from 149 uh, to 133, and the response is is that a uh, part of the hold harmless legislation is that uh, we are uh, being funded at uh, the 1617 uh, FTS amounts. So these numbers right here are reflective of a uh, 20,000 or 21,000 FTS mark. Uh, part of the implementation of uh, the funding formula, as it's written. Uh, is that if hold harmless goes away, we would no longer be funded at the 16, 17, 20,000 amount. We'd be funded at the amount we're actually serving at that time, which would be projected to be 16,100. So the loss of that 4,000 or 5,000 of FTS stability uh, with the elimination of hold harmless uh, accounts for that decrease that we see there. So I hope that provides some context uh, in response to the question. And I apologize for not having that uh, in my back pocket uh, when the question was asked. All right, I see a question from Simon and, and then Angelica, you're in the queue. Yes, thank you, Dr. Martin. I have an observation of what you just showed uh, and then a couple of uh, comments and perspectives. Uh, one is the observation that uh, when in your projections, when you get from 2627, when we're going to go over our fiscal cliff, it's very clear to me that the only reductions we're going to have in expenditures to buffer that comes from faculty, no other group at the college. Uh, now, this also is in context of last year, 
when many of the numbers that we saw presented were numbers that seemed almost exquisitely designed to have an effect at a bargaining table. Uh, so I am just stating something that has been reflected to me very often at the college, what comes up with the trust issues. Because if these numbers are not adjusted and they don't reflect reality, then they are seen as simply a bargaining tool or a projection as if there is a number we need to hit. In that, my observation and my question is in relation to at the state level, our hold harmless right now is doing harm. It is explicitly decoupling our funding formula from serving students. And it was a problem that was specific to urban colleges like City College, and it's now a problem that every community college is dealing with post COVID. What advocacy are we going to have for coupling again our funding formula to the students we serve and the specific populations that we serve? Because we have been under the oppression of the student centered funding formula for changing our values of where we're moving, and we've been very good at adjusting for that. And yet right now, many of the challenges we have are at the state level because what you just described very clearly, we could get more students in the next three years into this college, we're not going to get funded for them. So is there advocacy going on? And that goes back to the area of bringing in revenue at the state level. Uh, the ob secondary observation to that is that what was stated today and is missing from this discussion is programmatic impacts. Not once a program has gone, but even the indicators right now of where we're headed and the challenges that we're trying to do with layoff notices or with schedule reductions has an active impact on some of our most valued faculty. Uh, that has to do with many of our younger faculty, that has to do with many of our faculty of color, that has to do with the representation. And it really has to do with our programs too because areas in demand no one is going to look at a seven-year projection and say, I'm going to place, place my career on a look at City College when what I've done is I've laid out a pathway that's leading us continued to a cliff. Uh, so addressing anything we can do that, we've asked multiple times for the programmatic discussion to lead the cut discussion, and we seem to be in the exact opposite situation again, where we're having the cut discussion, and then we're going to see what, it, what happens when it shakes up our programs and things like the theater department disappear even though we're not killing them this year it's just what's going to be the consequence if you could address any either of those two things the advocacy question and then how we're going to preserve programs during this time i'd appreciate well, it. I, I appreciate both questions and uh the advocacy i, I think is something that uh, is has never been more important uh, in regards to the student center funding formula uh, we are uh, working with uh, different uh, institutions right now that are similar to us uh, to advocate for uh, the pending uh, reform of the hold harmless cliff. Uh, so that is something that we are at the table and will continue to be at the table. There's also legislation that uh, are pending uh, legislation or proposed bills uh, regarding the funding and how uh, non-credit programs are, are funded. I think we are uh, in a position uh, based on our uh, student structure, the structure uh, that we serve uh, to really uh, be a part of those conversations and make sure that we are advocating for any uh, non-credit funding uh, enhancement uh, that we can. So those are budget discussions. I think as the May revise uh, starts getting closer, uh, you'll see those advocacy efforts become more on the forefront uh, but the two items right now that I know uh, we will be at the table advocating for at the state level is reform in the funding formula, uh, but also uh, changes to how non-credit uh, funding is, is uh, done in the community college system. Uh, real quickly on uh, the programmatic discussion, I think those are, those are great points. And I think you know, we need to continue to challenge ourselves to find ways to have broad-based programmatic discussions that don't happen uh, in, in silos. Uh, I also think that it is imperative that it's done through or done parallel with the budget discussions because we need to understand and we need to recognize what is the instructional FTF that we're working with? What is the available 
uh, pot of funding that we have to build and continue to enhance our pathways and our programs. So having the programmatic discussion is valid and I think it's important, but also making sure that as those discussions are, are happening, we're not creating uh, situations to where there's just no funding to attach to uh, decisions that are being made from the programmatic standpoint. So I think that uh, that's something we can uh, find ways to improve upon. And, and I know we didn't touch directly onto the programmatic side this afternoon, but having that discussion or finding ways to interlude uh, these two conversations is something that I think would benefit the entire district. So I, I appreciate the comments and, and uh, thank you for, for jumping in. All right, I see uh, Angelica, your hands up. All right, I'll try to keep this really, really short. I know there isn't much time. Um, this is again, more of an observation and the questions I ask are more uh, rhetorical. But first off, um, I'm a student here at City College of San Francisco and you know, I'm about to transfer, but but that's besides the point. Uh, things that I'm hearing at the state level when it comes from the chancellor's office is that there, you know, there is a very real decrease in enrollment through the K through 12 system, which does, you know, is part of the largest part of, of our student population that feeds into the community college system. But that signifies to me that we then we need to look and prioritize our older our adult learners our non credit students when it comes to funding and find ways to increase enrollment there because I think that sounds like that's where we're going to get uh, a lot of traction getting enrollment mm -hmm. from those students who don't fit that let's say quote unquote traditional student category like right out of high school going to community college. Um, because if we if also if we cut off faculty and cut our classes, what is there going to be for that population that we now have to turn to again if there is that decrease in enrollment of K through 12 uh, students, how are we going to have assist a college or a college if we don't take into account that again our population is changing I think everyone in this room is aware. I think the common community college student is now older than 18 through 24. Um, so I guess my point with that was, what is the college going to do to try to increase enrollment um, of students? Because I think again, enrollment means more money coming in, obviously more students that come into City College of San Francisco means more money for the college. So what is the college planning on doing to uh, pivot to address again, the changing demographic of community college students. Yeah, really good and question. And to increase enrollment. Yeah, really, go. really good question. And I'll try and respond and touch base on, on all the questions, but I, I want to uh, affirm uh, and agree that over the last 10 years, I think throughout the state, the uh, high school uh, population or the number of K through 12 uh, students going through uh, public education here in California has, uh, from what I've seen, uh, significantly uh, decreased. Uh, so what uh, a community college or what has historically been uh, identified as, as maybe a traditional student that uh, comes here out of high school looking to get two years of quality education and affordable price and then transfer, that traditional or that concept, uh, that's changing, that's evolving. As you mentioned, our student population today uh, is continuing to, to be a bit older uh, and so in thinking about how do we serve uh, older uh, or an older uh, demographic or by average an older demographic, it's really uh, understanding the needs of those individuals. For example, those wraparound support services, uh, a traditional or, or historically traditional uh, student coming from high school may have the ability to go to school full time, not have to work. Uh, may have uh, financial uh, support from uh, family or, or relatives. Uh, the students that we are, are working uh, to serve uh, may not all fit into that, that box that was once defined, I think, in a different way uh, 10 years ago or so. So in looking at how we move forward and serving the, the population of students that need us today, it's really those support services, uh, but it's also providing uh, the skills and the programs and the pathways uh, that, that meet their needs. Uh, a lot of uh, you know, the students nowadays uh, may come to us not looking for a associate's degree to transfer to UCSF. They may be coming 
as a mid-career individual who is looking to upskill or learn a new skill so they can get a job enhancement or get a promotion or provide more opportunities. So that's why you've seen a significant uh, increase in uh, strong workforce opportunities, not only here at City College, but throughout the state as well. Uh, so it's really looking at those uh, alternative uh, academic pathways and programs that aren't necessarily a two-year associate's degree to a four-year, not to say that that pathway or that student's not important because they absolutely are. Uh, but being mindful that not every student who comes onto our campus and fewer students, I think, than in years past uh, are looking for uh, an alternative, whether it's a skill or a certificate or, or learning opportunities for uh, personal enrichment. Uh, it's being mindful that, uh, as you mentioned, our student demographic uh, is changing and has changed and, and may continue to change. So thank you, Angelica, for the question. Thank you for uh, participating in today's forum as well. It's always great to to engage with the students, so thank you. All right, uh, looking for um, any more Zoom hands, I appreciate. We went a little bit uh, over time, but uh, I appreciate the questions. I uh, appreciate the engagement. Uh, as we discussed in the beginning, this is really the first of what will be uh, several iterations of campus dialogue uh, in different groups. Uh, we'll focus on our governance groups here in the near future. Uh, please reach out to me if you're a member of a committee or if you're a member of a stakeholder group and would like to have a similar presentation. I would be more than happy to go uh, wherever the conversation is needed uh, and engage to the best of my ability. So please reach out to me. Uh, and as we move forward into the next several weeks and, and months, as we know, uh, there may be some tough decisions uh, on our horizon. I will continue to have forums like this, dialogue, uh, like this uh, as we move forward, uh, because ultimately City College will have to be here uh, next year and it will continue to be here in the future. And we will work together to make sure that that day uh, is bright. Uh, so please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you uh, for all of your questions, all of your engagement, 42 minutes of uh, additional time. Uh, we are recording. So if you have colleagues or if you wanna watch this again, uh, will be posted uh, on our website here